I'm going to go ahead and begin with some housekeeping that's on my to-do list here. The first thing I'd like to do is to go ahead and introduce you to uh, Pastor Robin, who is providing us the facilities for this uh, forum this evening. Thank you. My name is Reverend Robin Matthews Johnson. You can call me Pastor Robin, and we're delighted to be able to host this forum here today. Uh, we take our community work in the community uh, very seriously here in Watsonville in our uh, county, and we're just happy that you're here. And I'd say give yourselves a round of applause. Good job. <laughs> There are restrooms at the back of the hall, men's, women's, wheelchair accessible. If you have any building type questions, I'll be at the back during the whole program and you feel free to ask me. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you again. I do have Betty Bobita that's in the back of the room as well. She has some index cards in case anybody has an interest with time permitted uh, for uh, anything following the forum here if we, we do have the time for the candidates on that part of it. Otherwise, we do have it moderated with um, the content prepared um, that should be pretty close to the allotted time that we're giving so far this evening. The next thing I would like to do is, can we make sure that we have the cell phones on silent so that we don't disturb anybody in their presentation this evening? Yes, thank you. And let's see here, Jeremy, I'd like to go ahead and have you raise your hand a little bit. What we've got is community television, and he will be working on preparing this on an edit in the next couple of days. I believe YouTube, it'll be on the same station that our city council meetings are aired, channel 70, I believe. Yep. And so look forward to that, or anybody that you know that wasn't able to attend, you can encourage them to take a look at the community station for this to be aired um, in the future here. Thank you. And absentee ballots again on May 5th. So this is a good time for you to be here to sort of listen to what the candidates have to say prior to getting that ballot in the mail for about 68% of our voters. And at this point, what um, I'm going to do is let the candidates do their introductions. And I will start with those that have come first and work our way down. And they've got about three minutes. And here's the question for the introduction that I'd like them to include. Please tell us about your top three to five goals, priorities and expectations that you are to work on or have accomplished as a County Board of Supervisor for our District 4. And Mr. Butro, you arrived first, so we'll have you begin. This is all in five minutes. You can have a seat, we'll just get to see you. Okay, I'll stand now. Because I'm so people can see me. Hi, everybody. My name is Jimmy Dutra. Um, I want to say thank you for first of all attending. I know that you're taking time out of your busy day to be here, and I appreciate that. I also want to thank my family and friends who have come for support as well. Um, I appreciate all of you as well, so thank you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jimmy Dutra. I was born and raised here in South County. I'm almost 40 years old, and my family's been here since the 1930s. So there's quite some history with us, um, in, and our roots are deep here in this community. I attended local schools. I um, graduated from Watsonville High School, uh, went on to Santa Clara University, where I earned my bachelor's in political science, and then went on and worked on three national campaigns. Um, I was also privileged at that time to be an intern for President Clinton, and um, later worked for the governor, and then ended, um, before going into uh, becoming in, into business, uh, working for Geraldine Ferraro, who is, um, for most of you know, our first female on a major ticket, um, she ran for vice, she was on, as vice president. I'm running um, on change. I'm the only candidate who has not been molding this community um, for decades. I came home about four years ago and I saw a community that was in disrepair. You just, all you have to do is just drive down the street to know that we're not getting the resources down here that we, we deserve. You go down Green Valley Road, which is one of my top three priorities that um, sh um, Ms. Kaufman would like us to talk about, Green Valley Road needs to be repaired. It's, a, it's, it's alongside of a, of a county park that we should be proud of, and we shouldn't have, a, have to be driving along a pothole street. There are, are places that lack sidewalks, like Lakeview Middle School, where our kids have been uh, walking home from school without even sidewalks being provided. This, is, this would happen in no other place in this county. And like I tell people, you hit Aptos and you go north, you see where the money is being spent. The money is not coming back here. And that is something that I'm gonna be 
fighting for every single day in Santa Cruz. We need to get the resources down here that we deserve. We have not had resources down here in many years. And all you gotta do is look around and see how we have a failing infrastructure, we have failing roads, we have places where kids don't even have sidewalks to walk on. And you will see that this is something that needs to be addressed. And we need to send somebody with a fire in their belly to get it done. It has not been done over the past four years. We have not had any resources to get down here. I will go, I will fight to get roads fixed, to have our students be able to walk on sidewalks. I also talk about working with the, the city and bringing in some more family-friendly businesses. I think that when Cabrillo Lanes was shut down, we lost an artery to this community. This was a place that I went to as a child that is now gone, and now we have to leave our community to spend our dollars in other places, such as Aptos and Gilroy and Salinas. My time has run out. You will hear more from me. And I'll continue to talk to you about the changes that I believe in. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, in, in my process of moderation, I should probably tell you that I am hosting this. And my name is Trina Kaufman Gomez. I am from the community here, so I'll tell you that. And then I will also just make sure that our, our candidates are aware that we are giving you three minutes up front. You'll have three minutes per question that's being addressed to you. It won't start until the question has been completed. And Mr. Sales, I believe you're the second one to arrive, so I'm going to go ahead and give you your next three minutes for your introduction. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for putting this on. It's, it's a pleasure. This is the first time that all four of us have met together, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here in the middle of Watsonville. I was born in Watsonville, number eight of ten kids, grew up on a four and a half acre farm, a very small farm out on Lakeview Road. And I actually grew up working in the fields because it was such a small farm, we actually worked for our neighbors because they actually paid us. Um, and, and worked there with my uh, brothers and sisters and my mom. Um, my first job out of the fields was actually at the Fox Theater downtown when I was about 16 years old. A little bit about my family background, my dad emigrated from the Philippines as a teenager. Uh, was a barber his entire career. He also served in the U.S. Navy. My mother was the daughter of migrant workers and traveled all over the country, uh, settling in Watsonville. And I uh, worked in the canneries for quite a while and actually worked for 30 years, or nearly 30 years, as a school bus driver for the school district. Uh, next month, she will celebrate her 88th birthday. I've been a small business owner, uh, owned Penguin Printing, which is downtown Watsonville, owned that for 10 years and was very successful and sold it. But then I went into real estate because I wanted to spend more time with my kids and I actually got the chance to work in their classrooms and uh, be a part of coaching Little League and doing things like that. And I think, I, well, my background, uh, I've been a local realtor, as I mentioned, for 27 years. I uh, was a member of the Watsonville Planning Commission for a short period, then was elected to the Pajaro Valley School Board. And I've been, I now represent the Pajaro Valley at the county level on the County Board of Education. I've held that position for quite a while. I've got two kids. Reagan is a graduate of NYU and lives in San Francisco. And about three weeks after the June election, she's getting married. So it's a busy time for us. My son is on the waiting list. He did all the prerequisite work at Cabrillo, and he's on the waiting list for the nursing program at Cabrillo College. And as I mentioned, I'm, I've been an experienced uh, elected official. Uh, my big thing is protecting the farmland around in the Pajaro Valley, trying to keep the urban limit line that is in place honored and quit from being able to push out into that. Uh, you know, Watsonville's core and Watsonville's history, and I believe Watsonville's soul is in agriculture. And I want to preserve that. The other thing is, you've been looking at awful funding coming from the state. I know that because I'm a school board trustee. And the city knows it because their employees are still being furloughed on Fridays. Yes. Money is beginning to come in. And I want to make sure that we're very conservative in planning how to spend that money looking at things that are very effective and not looking at just because money's coming in that we need to spend it. So that's a big priority for me. Um, and also services, as was mentioned, to the Pajaro Valley. I think there's so much that needs to be done here in the Pajaro Valley and we don't really have, we don't have the, the ability to really argue with the other supervisors and make sure things get done. And I think I have that ability and I'd like to be doing it for you. Thank you. And thank you. And I have our incumbent, Mr. Greg Cabot, for our last okay, few minutes for this introduction. Uh, 
Terry. Oh, I'm sorry. Terry, I think Terry's the one. Okay. <laughs> See, I shall have favoritism here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Medina, would you please share with us? <laughs> thank you. And thank you, uh, Trina and the committee, for bringing us here tonight. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm a fourth generation Santa Cruz County resident. I've lived and worked in our community for 30 years. I'm married to my beautiful wife, Myrna, who's here tonight, and we've raised our son here, Alvin. I have four, over 43 years of increasing responsibility and success in law enforcement, covering five jurisdictions of government, 27 of those years right here in our community. I have worked with four city managers, hired by John Radden, over 50 council members, 25 to 30 neighborhood groups, and all with different points of view and political perspectives. I remain the longest tenured police chief in Watsonville history. I was a paid student police officer at Cabrillo College and graduated from their police science program. I'm a graduate of the 122nd session of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. I'm a six-year veteran of the United States Army Reserve Military Police. And like many of you in this room, I have a history of community service outside my employment profession. I started working with nonprofits in 1973 and uh, engaged uh, in that endeavor by my mentor, Ray Belgar. Here in the Pajaro Valley, where I was on the founding board of directors of the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, which spawned New School. I was on the Mental Health Advisory Board of Santa Cruz County. Today, I continue on the uh, Watsonville Community Hospital Board of Trustees as its chair. I'm the treasurer of the Independent Square uh, Housing for Disabled People. I'm a member of the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County, which matched philanthropic donors and investments with community needs. We disperse over $6 million, mostly to the Pajaro Valley. In 2001, I was honored and voted Man of the Year by the PV Board of uh, Chambers and Agriculture. My third asset to you is that I uh, am a private businessman. I co-founded Incorporated Belcher, Ely Medina and Associates, a safety solution company for government and private business. I have about five things in my platform. Hopefully we can discuss it tonight. But overarching everything uh, that I'm going to talk about tonight is the fact that Pajaro Valley, District 4, many of our groups, we just don't play well in the sandbox. We are not taken serious by anybody. So uh, my first job, one, is to try to bring the farmers, the council, the county, the pilots together on a common ground and start to move forward on some of the issues we're going to talk about tonight. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Greg Caput. I was born and raised in Watsonville, went to Minnie White School, EA Hall, Junior High, uh, Watsonville High School, Cabrillo College, Santa Clara University. Uh, I'm the most proud of getting my degree from Minnie White Elementary. <laughs> and uh, then I went on to uh, law school and uh, graduated uh, from Western State University down in Fullerton, California. Um, so I, I worked in the fields uh, during the summers in high school, and uh, that's just some of my background. But uh, part of the question was uh, in our opening comments on uh, what our priorities are going to be. Uh, one is, uh, what are the commitments I made and what are the commitments I'm going to continue to make? And uh, we have got funding. Uh, a great uh, deal of uh, tax money came to South County. I don't think uh, $300,000 to fix the end of uh, Green Valley Road at Wheelock and uh, Hazeldale Road. That was a major project that took 60 different permits that we had to get because the Army Corps of Engineers had to sign off on it. Uh, Paulson Road was at $94,000. We got that done. All of those were on the waiting list for the, uh, for the last four years. I've been in office for three years and, and you know, five months. Uh, the Pajaro River was another project for 18 years that was sitting there and it was a good plan. Uh, we had the bases loaded when I got elected but we got a grand slam. I wasn't willing to wait another 18 years and look at a good plan, just sit there. 
Our staff, myself, and Public Works in the county worked very hard to get all the permits so that 300,000 cubic yards of sediment was removed from the Pajaro River, making it much safer in case of a big storm. And uh, we were always under the pressure of a big storm, and ever since uh, we got it done, we've been in the middle of a drought. So anyway, but we are ready and uh, very proud of that. Um, uh, as far as funding and, uh, and, and different things, I want to make sure that the uh, Sheriff's Department and CAL FIRE is fully funded. I am endorsed by the California Fi uh, County Firefighters Local, and I'm endorsed by the pilots. So talk about bringing people together. Uh, that's just one example. Uh, when, I, when I first ran, I promised to protect farmland. I worked very hard, measured T. It was a terrible uh, idea to try to propose uh, putting urban, urban sprawl, really, uh, over prime ag land. It was defeated by 70%, almost identical in every precinct in the city when they counted up the final votes. Uh, I'll continue to expand uh, uh, veteran services in uh, South County. I'm a veteran myself, eight years in the National Guard and Army, uh, U.S. Army Reserve. So that's, that's my commitment. We're open now two days a week, uh, veteran services in Watsonville, compared to uh, one day a week uh, before I got into office. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm very sensitive to everyone's time here, so I will make sure that we do pick mics up by three, the three-minute mark. The way that this will be conducted, I have four, we have four different topics. Each of the topics will have an individual question that will be out addressed to the candidates. And what I'm going to do is have the candidates choose which one, which packet they're going to get. I have four of them set aside here. And Mr. Dutra, you arrive first, so I'll let you pick which one first. Okay. Sorry. And Mr. Sales? Hmm. There we go. Mr. Medina. Mr. Cabot. All right. So let me see. All right. Mr. Dutra will be number three on the list on the questions on the packet. Mr. Medina? Four. Mr. Cabot? Uh, can I trade? I got number one. <laughs> So we'll go out of the gate with you, and then I have Mr. Sales on second. I guess so. And of course, my pen is out of ink, and this stand is shrinking on me, so bear with me. The, thank you. The, the topics that will be brought up for questioning this evening will be on homelessness, they'll be on economy, they will be on land use, and they will be on transportation. All of these were well researched out for topics based on the professions that have met directly with County Board of Supervisors on different pro uh, programs and uh, presentations that were done, funding being allocated. So all of these are real relevant to the position that is being run for here. So the first uh, question that I have will go to Mr. Cabot because he's our first <laughs> player here. And It will be based on our homelessness. Your three minutes won't begin until I finish the question for you. So what I'm going to do is give you some content, provide you with the question, and then your three minutes will begin then. Okay? The first question, new studies have come back to tell us that our homeless situation has not improved. Rather, our homelessness has dramatically increased throughout our county. We fall short of needing nearly $10 million for work efforts to remediate this problem when we now have about 1.9 million in funds being allocated to more than a dozen agencies and projects throughout the county. Your question, what kind of out-of-the-box approach do you think we can implement to address this issue? Thank you. Uh, we, we have a rescue mission here in Watsonville. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, it faced uh, closure. The Salvation Army, which did great work for many years, uh, decided in San Francisco that they didn't want to uh, continue funding the uh, homeless shelter here in Watsonville, which does uh, provide uh, shelter for about 60 men in the winter and about 30 women. Uh, 
there was a critical time when it looked like there wasn't going to be the funding and it was going to close. And uh, here in September, uh, I got together with a group of uh, wonderful people here in Watsonville. And uh, the rescue mission, Parvo Rescue Mission Team Challenge stepped forward and said, we will run the program. Uh, we have to get up and running. They have to do, uh, they have to provide meals, they have to provide uh, bedding, uh, showers and uh, facilities, uh, separate uh, shelters for both men and women. I, uh, when I got on there, uh, because of uh, a commitment I made uh, to donate uh, part of my salary, a big part of my salary, I told them as far as the funding goes, I would go with matching funds. I would uh, put up $18,000 of my own money out of my paycheck. It's, uh, out of, it's your money. It's your taxpayer money. It was going to raises for the, uh, uh, for the Board of Supervisors that I said I wanted to cut and uh, pay. I think they're overpaid. And uh, that includes myself. So anyway, uh, the, shelter, uh, the shelter opened up. The funds were matched. And, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to say two years later now, it's still functioning. It's still in danger of losing uh, the support. Salvation Army owns the facility, owns the property, and they've been allowing uh, the rescue mission to run it uh, without charging them rent. And different churches throughout the uh, Pajaro Valley have been cooking all the meals for the homeless in the area. So it is a problem that has to be addressed. And uh, we can't just uh, turn our backs on it and pretend that uh, people aren't the, out there and they're suffering and they're suffering greatly. Okay, I represent South County. I made a promise and a commitment that I would represent everybody. South County is different than the rest of the county. I try to, I try to represent uh, everybody from all ages and also whether or not they're documented or undocumented. Our offices work very hard to, uh, uh, with undocumented uh, people that are here that face uh, tremendous crisis problems. And they could end up uh, being homeless or being uh, actually having to pack up and go back to Mexico. Uh, we've had many cases like that. So uh, the, the homeless issue is very personal to me. I think I've made a very personal contribution <coughs> locally here to uh, lessen the problem. Thank you. Our next question will go to our candidate, Mr. Sales. Our county statistics for short-term and chronic homelessness in our county has increased from 2,771 homeless people to 3,536 in just two years. What cash strap budget, with cash strap budgets, this has really tapped our financial resources both the city and the county levels, and have spilled over to public safety compromises and costs. Mr. Sales, what would you do to relieve and provide cost containment of this matter? Thank you very much. Um, the uh, probably the biggest issue for me is I see government uh, role in this as really being coordination and when you look at the city of Watsonville, the county of Santa Cruz, the state of California, and even schools, because that's something I'm very familiar with, identifying the need, that's the number one thing, is looking at the need and looking at how we can address it. One of the things that I can finally do when elected as a supervisor is address mental health. That's something that we've done in the school districts and making sure that we uh, work with children at the earliest possible age to look at what their problems are and what needs they have. And homelessness is a very big issue in, in our school communities. And it carries over into, of course, the general population. Uh, I think that the government, in, when elected, has a role of stepping in and trying to coordinate what is going on. As you pointed out, there is the problem that we have in government, especially the cities and counties, is that we're looking at diminishing funds. But luckily, we're looking at a time now where we're actually beginning to look at a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it may be a long time for that train to come down the tracks, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that the coordination that needs to happen between the government agencies with private organizations is key to making this work. One of the problems we have, and, and you know, it's, it's a heck of a problem, is this is a beautiful place to live. And if you're going to be homeless, it's a beautiful place to live. Uh, you look at what's happening back east and in the, the northeast and the, the plain states. Uh, we attract a lot of people because 
we're not as harsh as other places. But the key to solving this problem, I believe, is working with private organizations, private individuals. What has happened in the past, a like good example is I was very active with the Salvation Army. I was actually the treasurer back when they had the earthquake, which was kind of exciting. But uh, when they ran into the problem of losing their funding from the larger organization, the fact that community groups got together and said, no, we're not going to let this happen. We have a facility. And we've had people who've donated and given so much for this facility that we have to do something. And I think that's the role that the government should play, is bringing people together and making things happen so that something gets done. We have to take care of the people in greatest need. That is always should be the number, number one priority of anybody, regardless of politics or church or you know, whatever position you're in. We should always be looking at the people in greatest need, no matter what that need is. Thank you. And Mr. Pedro, I have your question prepared for you. We have all heard the discussion about the concerns around public safety as a result of homeless encampments being set up in dark corners around our community, as well as loitering downtown where we are already limited on shelter resources and capacity. The perception in our community is that it's not safe coming down to shop, which directly correlates to sales and tax revenue. Your question is, what resources would you use to ensure our public safety by addressing the drug use and mental health issues and lack of shelter resources associated with this chronic problem? Great. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with Dana. He actually answered the question. We have this is also related to mental health. A lot of homeless, a lot of homeless people are on the streets because many have mental health issues. And unfortunately, here in South County, we have a, a large number of mental health case issues, which are predominantly downtown. We have two buildings which a lot of our local services, our police and firefighters, are called to daily to tend to the needs of people um, dealing with mental health issues. There, we have lower people who loiter, we have people who are walking around downtown, around the buildings where they reside. And this is the place where the county has been pushing people um, for many years. And I'm sure that many people have gone downtown, you've all seen um, people walking around, and we, there's actually people who work from the county who watch over the buildings. The rest of the has a full-time staff member, and this is what we have to work with. We have to stop being the sponge for the rest of the county. We need to stand up and say, this is a county issue, and we need to start distributing the, the issues that we have when it comes to homeless and mental health. You know, if you take away the, the percentage that is with the mental health issue, we also, a lot of homeless people, you know, we need to create jobs for them. We need to put them into programs that are gonna give them the skills to get out of being homeless and get them back into the workforce. These are ideas that need to be implemented. We can stand here and we can, you know, say as much as we want to support programs um, that will take in a bunch of, you know, a, a homeless people, but we actually need to take it a step further and start putting in programs to allow them to attain jobs and to get the services needed to help them with the mental health issues that, you know, many people have in our community. Um, I also agree to, I mean, we need to also work with, there's a, an organization, Loaves and Fishes. I, I worked with them um, not too recently. And they do, they sell out. So the numbers are real down here. If you just go and volunteer some time to your local um, you know, food, ba food banks or uh, homeless shelters, you'll see that the numbers are in staggering, um, in staggering numbers. And a lot of people are afraid that you know, if they go somewhere else, they're not going to get the services. So let's send them to South County, where we know that we already have the places for them to go, which is located downtown, and we have the services which we can offer. We need to step away and offer opportunities for um, the homeless. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Medina. The Department of HUD has identified Santa Cruz County as having the fifth largest homeless population per capita in the nation. Cost containment of this problem stems from securing housing and getting case management for this invisible population of our community. 
Your question is, how would you go about allocating resources to the challenges these homeless statistics have identified? Well, first let me make sure everybody understands that homelessness as it relates to the Pajaro River within the city limits is not anything that any of us will, can vote on or deal with in terms of county government and funding. The Rescue Mission, the Salvation Army, um, does not get county funding because it's a religious, they're a religious organization. So the facilitating and trying to use community help with those organizations is uh, what we would try to do. HUD um, funds um, places like Independent Square for people with disabilities uh, uh, and places to live. HUD does not fund um, programs like the Pajaro Valley Women's Shelter, who, as a member of the Board of Supervisors, we would be able to direct money to, and we have to keep doing that. So here's, here's the issue, really. There are two, and you need to realize that the homeless issue mostly impacts the unincorporated area of Santa Cruz County behind Safeway. That is the sheriff's office jurisdiction. That is the unincorporated area. That's where we have to focus our abilities and resources as members of the Board of Supervisors. The two wishes are this. We have women and families with children that we truly have to get out of cars and into the Pajaro Valley Women's Shelter for security. We have to, if they will abide by the rules, uh, into the various other organizations, wherever they are in the county that we have jurisdiction. Secondly, we have to stop figuring out how to make people stop drinking, stop using drugs, um, because that's what they want to do. If you, go, if you have my experience over these years, people don't want to go to these various places that were described here because they don't want to follow the rules. So here's an out of the box thought, is we find a place away from the economy Look what's happened in Santa Cruz. We can learn from that. Away from the economy, put some porta potties there so they stop using your backyards and mine as toilets, and perhaps even some tent cabins so that at least they are somewhat taken care of and yet out of the way. Thank you. Our next topic will be about our economy. We'll still stay with the same cycle of one through four, and then at the end there, we'll, we'll do the closure on the, the candidate um, discussion for the follow-up. So Mr. Captain, your question, your, your comment here is, we have several economic development projects currently slated for the Mid-County as part of our short-term economic plan. Your question is, what do you see your role in participating in identifying and expanding these projects in the South County area to create economic vitality. Right. <clears throat> yeah. I will make a quick comment on homelessness before I get into this, but uh, we can keep the uh, homeless shelter open at Watsonville, and uh, I'd like to ask the other candidates to uh, match me dollar to dollar. It takes $120,000 to keep that homeless shelter open. And uh, that'll, that'll help clean up uh, some of the downtown area. Small business accounts for 70% of all the uh, jobs in the South County, Watsonville area. If you add agriculture, the, the numbers go up way much higher. But small business drives the economy. Uh, the, the big box stores, the, uh, the bigger stores only account for about 28 to 30%. So we, we do have to do, uh, we, we do have to protect the, uh, the downtown area. There's a lot of work that has to be done there. We have uh, an empty Godshocks building, I realize that. 
uh, we, we have to get and invite business to come downtown. And that, that means that you have to have a planning process that doesn't restrict them from actually getting and coming in here because you've bogged them down with too many requirements and too many restrictions and too many permits and too many fees. Uh, we, we, we have to get them to come here and we have to be uh, uh, a business friendly and uh, that's something that of course the city of Watsonville really has to address. We have to protect also our ag uh, agricultural jobs. Uh, there are a lot of people working out there. They work very hard. They support their families. Uh, almost all of the uh, affordable housing, and affordable housing in South County means low income housing. That's for people with combined incomes of $48,000 minimum to be able to get into the housing. We've accounted for almost in entirely for the whole county, all of the affordable housing for low income. The rest of the county is put in what they call affordable housing, but the minimum requirement that they have for people working is that they have to have a combined income of over $100,000. That doesn't fit in South County. So we, we have to work with the, uh, we've, had, uh, we've had four different uh, econ economic vitality meetings in South County to try to promote uh, local small business and also try to uh, invite some of the uh, bigger box stores, if you want to call them, to go downtown, go into the uh, Godchucks. Uh, you know, we, we, we have work to do, I, I understand that. But we, we, can't, we can't start building in the unincorporated area and then uh, kill off downtown and draw all the business away. So uh, we have to focus on what's going good, $700,000 $700, a year. Uh, comes into uh, uh, the county from agriculture, and we, we're, we're trying to do uh, permit processes to make it easier for them to function. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Sales, as a result of the state cutbacks and the dissolution of the redevelopment agency, we no longer have economic funding resources we once had and now we must be more creative with fewer funds. Your question is, how will you go about collaborating with and educating our chambers, councils, com and community about resources which can further the economic development to benefit our community? I, I like the way that that question was phrased or, or stated because we're talk talking about educating the chamber. Um, I think it's the opposite. I think the government needs to look at the Chamber of Commerce and say, what do you need? What do we need to change? How do we need to lessen regulation? How do we need to make the process better so that you're attracted to come to Watsonville? If you look on a, country, a, a, a nationwide level, you're looking at a situation where you've got states competing with uh, licensing fees, uh, income or uh, corporate taxes, those types of things, to invite uh, businesses to come to their states. California is having a hard time. I'm seeing things on TV where, where New York is doing a 10-year free tax, tax-free zones and things like that. We need to be looking at talk to the business people, not tell the business people what they need to do, but ask them what the cities and the county and the state needs to do to earn their business, to earn their respect, and to attract them to our area. Uh, there's some of the things that are great about Watsonville is that you know, it was pointed out that, that small business is a big part of it. I, I owned a small business on Main Street. At one point, my family had a, my dad's barber shop was on the 200 block. My sister's beauty shop was inside of Got Shops. My printing company was on the 500 block. Uh, since that time, the city used redevelopment money to tear down the 200 block, put tens of businesses out of business. It sat vacant, half that lot sat vacant for 20 years. And uh, so, so my idea of the, the, uh, the city or the county investing in business, I really have a hard time with. I think we should talk to business and talk to them about how to encourage them. Uh, God shocks, unfortunately, we've all seen what happened to that. And again, we need to work with the owner of the building and say, what would it take from the city to make something happen? Not tell them what to do. Um, the, the, uh, my business on the 500 block, unfortunately, the building was, almost fell down in the earthquake. Uh, but luckily, I had sold it by then and gotten into real estate. 
But uh, my thing is, we need to be working with the businesses and the chamber and asking them what it's going to take to make things happen in Watsonville. One of the things that has always bothered me, and this was happening when I was a downtown business owner, let's do a study. Let's see what people want. You know what? They're still doing a study. I've been out of downtown and as a realtor for almost 30 years now. And they're still saying, what would it take to make people come downtown? I think it's more important to go to businesses and say, what would it take to bring you downtown? Thank you. Let's see, Mr. Dutra. I have. The, count, the county has been working with the Santa Cruz Business Council and the Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce on a broad range of economic development work plans to build jobs, enhance revenue in our tax base. Your question is, how would you work to ensure South County is fairly represented on this economic development team? This is a really important question to me. Um, I left after college, and as most of my friends did, and there weren't jobs to come back to. There, are no, there weren't any sustainable jobs, and there still aren't sustainable jobs today. Many people you know, your families, your friends, your kids, probably your grandkids as well, have left the community and not been able to come back. This is a big issue, and this is one of the reasons why I'm in this race. We need to bring this economy back in this community so that our families and friends can come back, so that we can start offering jobs for them to work in. I will work closely with Santa Cruz County and make sure that we are not neglected in this issue. Many of you have come to your door and I talk daily about what, I, what my plans are. This is an agricultural community and I don't see why we cannot be the Silicon Valley of Ag. Many things that we use out in the fields are made in Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, and these are engineers that we could be bringing home. We could be having them open business here and create what we use here at home. There are a lot of empty buildings in this community, and we talk about the Gottschalks building. Why can't we do what they did with the Sentinel building in Santa Cruz? They put Cruzio in there and other businesses went in there, and they started, they started flourishing. I've said from day one, and I've talked to many of you, downtown will never be back to what it is until you get the people down there. No rest, uh, restaurants and retail stores are not going to take a risk to open up in a place where people are not going. You need to get the bodies down there first. You, that means you need to create jobs like putting in um, technology businesses or places like Cruzio downtown. When you get the people there, then you will get the best restaurants coming, and then you will get the retail stores coming. But until people get their bodies down there, you're not, there's not going to be any success. So we need to start making incentives for these people to come to our community. We need to open the doors to our, to our kids and our family members to say, come home, open shop here. That we do not need to be leaving our community and not coming home anymore. And I will work very hard to make sure that we have a voice when it comes to our economy. And um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's now your turn. Monterey County has an economic development committee which consists of representation from the following expertise. Agriculture, finance, healthcare, education, labor, tourism, and the Board of Supervisors. Your question is, with Watsonville having one of the highest unemployment rates in the state of California, how would you see to it to ensure we develop appropriate policies, programs, and committees and activities that will support and develop a diversified economy. So I want to um, ask you to look a, a little bit at the bigger picture here. We are running for the County Board of Supervisors. We do not vote on the Gottschalks building. We do not vote on downtown empty stores. We don't have um, an oar in that water. So all of this discussion about what we would do is not something that we will ever have come before us. 
So let's try to focus on what it is that we can do as members of the Board of Supervisors. We can offer our assistance through the County Planning Department and through the County Budget to find a person like Barbara Mason, who is um, a lady devoted to economic development within the county, and reach out to the city, reach out to the chamber, reach out to the business council of this county, and see if we can't put together some funding for our own help person for economic development to work with the city's economic development person. Now, they do have, my colleagues here do have a point about it's people first. So to the extent that we can get these folks together, the chamber, the business council, the farm bureau, together to um, create some infill space. So you have this whole issue in the, in the industrial area. We've got empty buildings all over. We have car dealers that believe they will not be viable in 10 or 15 years. What are we going to do with that space? How can we develop that? And if there is a development plan, how do we share the taxes? Well, let me tell you, we're on the Board of Supervisors. We're not going to let it all go to the city of Watsonville. We're going to want to split it. The example there is the Freedom Center. The Freedom Center was in the county of Santa Cruz. It wanted to develop. It came into the city. They worked on it together. The citizens voted. And that tax um, that is generated there is now split 50-50, so it was a win-win. We can do some of those things that we've done in the past and get ourselves out of this. Um, I do believe that bringing people first to downtown will help private business know what to do with the people that are there. That's what they do. Government doesn't do business very well. Thank you. Can we open a door perhaps or cross breeze somehow? I think I'm melting our candidates here. Thank you. If not them, then me. <laughs> All right. What we've got next on the agenda for the questions will be on land use. And we'll continue the same rotation that we have. Mr. Cap will come first. Oh, that helps. That helps. Are you aware, as you are aware, there was a ballot initiative the residents of the city of Watsonville voted on regarding annexing a prime agriculture parcel west of the city. This initiative would have incorporated 95 acre, 94 acre parcel into the city limits that would have faced not only the County Board of Supervisors hurdle, but also that of LAFCO and AMBAG and I think Coastal Commission. As our County Board of Supervisor, your question is, uh, representing the South County, what are, your, what are some of your land use ideas you would entertain or consider to improve our economic vitality? Uh, when that issue came up, I wasn't a spectator. I participated fully in uh, opposing what I considered a terrible plan. We're talking about prime ag land, and some of the best land in the entire world for growing uh, ag agricultural products. Uh, 30 feet or, and more of uh, topsoil out in that area over the hundreds of years where uh, the soil is, is as rich as you can get. Uh, and then they, they come up with an idea with that Measure T, which is part of the question here, uh, that uh, there, there was really no plan on what to do. Uh, okay, if, if, we're gonna, if we're gonna consider anything, uh, we, can't, we can't cover up prime ag land. That's what drives the economy in South County. Okay, $700 million that comes here. Uh, we're not just talking about field workers out there uh, and they're, the, they're probably the most important people we have here. But we're talking about the people do the manufacturing, they do that locally, they make the, uh, the products where you put all of the, uh, uh, the vegetables or the fruit and everything else into it. 
the truck drivers that come here daily uh, and that uh, they're shipping it to all parts of the country. Uh, we also have the cold storages uh, that uh, have to uh, keep everything fresh. And uh, it, 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 it's driving our, our economy in South County. So we have to protect the, the jobs of the field workers. We have to protect the jobs of the packaging, the truckers, and everybody else. Okay, we, we have passed on the Board of Supervisors over 50 different permits to try to make uh, the county more business friendly. And, uh, and I think we're, we're getting, we're, we're actually getting things done. Uh, we've addressed a lot of these problems. We, we want to maintain what we have. We don't want to destroy the good things we have here with some kind of a dream that had really no backing behind it, okay? So uh, the Manabi Out project, I worked on that when I was on the city council and I've, uh, I've worked on it actually as a, board of, uh, a member of the Board of Supervisors. That is a good plan for South County. Uh, we're talking about 90-something acres out there. It's not prime ag land. We, uh, we worked very hard on getting access roads out there. We worked with the local uh, businesses, uh, couch distributors, trying to get them to come together to allow an access road there for uh, the manufacturing, for the, and then also safe routes to the school off of Ohlone Parkway. Uh, that plan would work. Uh, we're, we can bring in uh, close to 2,000 manufacturing jobs, but the city administration made some major mistakes uh, on when they did the entire project. So it, it didn't come under uh, economic, it didn't come under the redevelopment uh, of money and funding. But uh, we still have to look at that and state that the state of California can change things to make that project go forward. It's actually a very good project. Thank you. Mr. Sales? Our comment and question, historically, the South County has had many challenges and restrictions imposed during the negotiations with members of previous County Board of Supervisors regarding annexations, such as the Manabi Owl and properties which fell in the City of Freedom that was incorporated into the city limits of Watson. Your question would be, what and how would you leverage negotiations with the current supervisors with revenue and land use issues the South County faces? Thank you. I think probably the most important thing when you're looking at trying to work with the Board of Supervisors on land use and revenue is uh, plainly getting their respect. Uh, the, the bottom line is working with them not as as if you're looking up to them, but as an equal. And one of the things I think is, is good about my background is having, I was a local trustee in the school board, but currently, and for the last actually 20 years, I've been the Pajaro Valley representative to the County Board of Education. So every month I meet with people from Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, Live Oak, Aptos, and work with them to do what is best for bringing resources educationally to the Pajaro Valley. That has been my job for the last 20 years to stand up for this area. Uh, with the current Board of Supervisors, I think we actually have a great Board of Supervisors we can work with. Uh, in the past, we've had some real ideologues up there who kind of couldn't be turned and didn't want to you know, compromise on anything. And a matter of fact, what was brought up, the Manabi Owl issue, is probably the best example you'll ever see. When that came before LAFCO, and I was there, and you had about 43 speakers come before LAFCO, the Local Agency Formation Commission. 42 of them said, this is a good idea. 42 of the 43. We had Wetlands Watch there. We had the school district there. We had the Chamber of Commerce there. We had agriculture there. One person got up and said, I don't think it's a good idea. And you had somebody who was a member of the Board of Supervisors say, I think that's who we should listen to. I don't think that's the situation now. And I think what I bring to the table is the fact that I've had that experience of working with people from throughout the county. I think we've got a good board of supervisors that we can work with. I personally know every one of these people. I, I don't know the person, uh, uh, well, there's an election going on in Santa Cruz. So we'll see where that turns out. But everybody else on there I've worked with in the past, they've been very good people and enjoy working with them. Uh, Land use is a, a big deal down here. And as was pointed out, 
we were actually side by side working against Measure T. And that was a very important thing to do because there was a big push probably 10 years ago now, maybe even longer. It's called Measure U. And it said, let's draw a line. Let's bring everybody together, chamber, realtors, agriculture, business, uh, you name it, we brought them all, you know, literally meetings with 50 people in them and said, where can we find common ground to make this work? And we actually put together a plan, took it to the voters, and it passed. So I really want to try to stick to, as a matter of fact, I would insist we stick to that urban limit line and protect our agricultural core that is this valley. Thank you. Thank you. I have your question and comment. Land use is a highly debated topic throughout our county. We have such a limited resource available, and this is even more evident in Watsonville, which is limited to six and a half square miles, and where we have the density of 8,000 people per square mile, which far exceeds even the city of Oakland. This creates housing challenges and in an already costly housing market. Your question, when considering annexation, what infrastructure would you consider to balance housing, density, and job creation to support the affordability costs to live here? Thank you. Uh, this is where I definitely um, would disagree with the supervisor. You know, we get, this is a community that many of us see as home. We, we were raised here and we've seen this community change. These annexations, a lot of them are putting a lot of low income housing in onto the land. We're not building jobs, we're putting homes on here to, for low income purposes, and this has to stop. We had about 30 acres that had to go throughout Santa Cruz County. This happened a while ago, this is old news. 15 of those acres came down here to Watsonville. We cannot continue to be adding more low-income housing onto our properties. We don't have the services, we don't have the police force, we don't have the fire departments to handle this. We need to start building our economy, start putting jobs and buildings onto the lands that we're gonna be um, developing, and we need to start moving away from the low-income portion. We, don't, we have way more than our fair share. We took 50% of what needed to be put throughout this county. That is not fair. We need someone who's gonna go and fight for us to say that when you redistribute, it needs to be done fairly and equally. Now, I know with the Nabiao project, that is also on the plate. More low-income housing will be built on it. I will do everything, I will fight against it. I will also fight to save Atkinson Lane, which I know was we lost 10 acres there as well. When we're annexing, why don't we annex to put jobs and buildings on there that are actually gonna be putting people to work, not just house people down here. I will work endlessly to make sure that when we develop land, it is done properly. But we also gotta first take a look about all the empty buildings we have throughout our community. We need to start filling those as well. So we have a lot of property that's vacant, we have a lot of buildings that are vacant, and we have land that we wanna start developing. So uh, you guys have a fighter in me to go and make sure that things are distributed equally in this, when it comes to who's gonna be getting what, what fair share of housing throughout the community and on the land. Like we said, our economy is based off of agriculture. We cannot be continuing to get up agriculture to become home base for um, tons of people who aren't even working in the community. We need to create jobs, create jobs, create jobs, and I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Medina, let's see what I have for you. <laughs> well, it's not bad. <laughs> I hope that you feel that these have been pretty equally divided. Everything's been completely neutral, blindside in terms of what questions go to which candidate, so please uh, keep that in mind. While it has been a very slow process from our economic recovery as a county, the city of Watsonville has fallen far behind the remainder of our county in its recovery. At more than 22% unemployment rate, we still face more than double the highest unemployment figures in our state. 
How do you feel about South County job creation with land use development for projects such as big box stores, retail, <coughs> or attracting manufacturing jobs in the South County? Thank you. So, really easy for all of us to say jobs, 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 that's what we need. <laughs> but we have no land to create the jobs. And Measure T was dead on arrival, never going to happen, and um, uh, that's the way it is. We need to accept that. Farming is our foundation, but it is not the end-all, be-all, because if it was, we wouldn't have 23% unemployment. So we have to keep farming strong, but we have to find the tax base revenue someplace else non-forming business. That means to, we need to better promote some of the business that we have, like Pajaro Dunes, getting visitors here to stay and spend <coughs> and drive someplace in the South County to spend some money. Get them to Giz Ditch Farms and you pick them and promote uh, businesses that we have. Um, my colleagues spoke about Manabi Al. Here's what the County Board of Supervisors has to do in conjunction with the city, is we have to form a, a relationship so that we can go undo these restrictions. Manabi Al is so restricted because it is industrial only and the only way to get into it is through a residential street that is 12 feet wide. It is prohibited from having um, egress from Riverside or Ohlone. <coughs> so, restriction one, get rid of it. it. We need to put some commercial there. And everybody says we want to keep all of our businesses small. That's what we have, small businesses. It doesn't generate enough taxes for us. Um, there is a reason why Target is like the second or third highest grossing tax revenue generator in South County because people shop there. So we need to create some infill. We're not going to do farmland. We already figured that out. So we've got to get people like Bill Hansen or people with capital that will either redo buildings to bring in headquarters. I'll give you an example. Uh, Whole Foods headquarters located in South County. That brings 60 employees. If we could bring companies that would bring in 100 employees to a headquarters or bring back the courts for another 60 employees, pretty soon we would generate enough people for business to want to serve. And, and Manabial will be viable if we can work together and one of the members of the Board of Supervisors has already endorsed me. I'm ready to work with them. I've worked with Bruce McPherson my whole <coughs> career when he was in the Senate. So this can be done. Um, it, it's just going to take some very hard work to get it done. Thank you. Now, given time for a minute, if there are anybody that is in the audience that has questions, make sure you get them to Betty because I'm asking the last question. And after that, I do have a wrap up for the candidates. So if we have time permitted, I want to make sure that everybody would turn something into her in case I do have additional time left over before the end of the session. So our next question will be based off of transportation. Mr. Caput, the relationship the county has had with Caltrans means that we must involve the state and the federal government on funding resources that are allocated through Caltrans. The question, how would you work on prioritizing rollout projects using funds from the government make work programs to pair with the unemployment problems we have in this community? Well, if you're putting all of that on Caltrans, uh, they're not going to take care of all of our problems. Um, Caltrans, uh, I've dealt with them many times. I've dealt with them on the, uh, uh, the, the corridor, uh, Highway 152 at uh, College Road and Houlihan Road. 
Uh, we put in a uh, crosswalk, a safe route to the school there. There was nine years waiting. Uh, people uh, in, in that, the city of Watsonville was not involved in that because they uh, uh, they said it was outside the city limits. But the fact of the matter is that working with Caltrans and, and, and almost all the jobs that uh, that went into that eighty thousand dollar project were all local uh, local. Uh, construction workers and local electricians that put in the crosswalk and made it a safe route to uh, the uh, middle school there. That was eight years in the waiting and we did get the funding. So when we're talking about how uh, transportation and everything, sure we, we have to look at the widening of the, uh, the freeway that goes between here and Santa Cruz. Uh, everybody talks about the uh, traffic congestion of the people trying to get out of Watsonville. Uh, we have to create jobs here so people aren't actually commuting out of Watsonville. Maybe maybe more are going to come here and work. Manabiao is a good project. We worked very hard getting uh, access roads and safe routes for the school area. And uh, like I said, trying to get that area uh, built up and, and actually bringing manufacturing jobs here. Transportation, we can improve uh, greatly. Uh, we, we did it, uh, we, we actually bought the uh, rail, the rail line, uh, and uh, we're working very hard on trying to get that up. When I first got on the board, uh, the uh, railroad was up for sale, and the county was voting on actually uh, purchasing it. And I said I would go for it as long as they had passenger service for Watsonville. The, the actual plan on the books was to have only passenger service from Aptos, to uh, Santa Cruz, and uh, for the Watsonville area to Aptos was only freight. And uh, I'm <coughs> happy to announce that actually uh, in the rail uh, purchase now, uh, passenger service to Watsonville will be provided. Uh, I remember uh, my mother and my aunts, uh, they used to catch the train in Watsonville and actually go to Santa Cruz, the old Santa Cruz uh, uh, business college, they got their degrees there, and uh, you, you, it would actually be a, a one way of improving some transportation in the area. But uh, there's, there's a lot to do. Widening the freeway is not the only answer, okay? So we, we do have to look at it very closely. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Sales. There's quite a bit of deferred maintenance on our roads and infrastructure throughout the county. It is quite competitive to get funding for these projects. Your question is, what prioritization would you like to see in place for funding brought to this district on infrastructure projects? Uh, good. Good question in that it's something that I see all the time. Right? When you drive any, around anywhere outside of the city of Watsonville, in the county, where we have a role, uh, there are so many places where you go where you're going down the road and literally you have, in the middle of nowhere, there's a stop sign. And you, there's another stop sign on the other side because the road is washed out. And it seems like because the state has had so little money for so long because of budget issues and tax issues, that almost nothing has come to the local levels. It's all gone to big highway projects and things in the middle of the state, those types of things. So as far as priorities go, you know, I would love to see lighting everywhere. I'd love to see all the roads being widened with, with sites that have space for bicycle riders and maybe room for joggers too. But at this point, at this time, we need to take care of the deferred maintenance. It was mentioned earlier, some of the things that have been done in the last couple of years. There are dozens of things that still need to be done to be fixed, just so that we have good ingress and egress throughout our area. And those kind of things have been sitting there for, you know, well, unfortunately, for decades now. And those have to be our priority. The uh, other thing that is, is, I think, really precious, and this is kind of strange, I'm running for county supervisor, which means I'll actually have to go to work in Santa Cruz. And now, when we were talking about traffic, uh, the way that it bottlenecks, when they did the widening of Highway 1, they went, all they did was move the bottleneck down a, a couple of miles. And unless they widen the whole thing all the way, it doesn't make any sense. So there has to be a greater plan than just inching down and waiting for the funds. Uh, also with the rail trail, one of the things that I 
was worried about when they were talking about it was you hear a lot of talk about, even though they call it the rail trail, the trail, the trail, the trail, bike trail, walking trail, hiking trail. The money to buy that came from transportation funds that were earmarked for rail. And they used those funds to purchase it and then talk about making it a recreational place. Well, I stand with our current supervisor and saying that there needs to be a line going from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. And there should be hubs at every major area where, uh, that are transportation hubs, like bus stations and parking and those types of things, so that people can get to here, to Aptos, to Capitola, to Santa Cruz, and even up towards Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo, so that we can get more people off the highway, even though that does need to be fixed. But as far as priority, there's so much that needs to be repaired before we start looking at what we'd like to see happen. Thank you. Now let's see, Mr. Nugent. 32 miles of coastal trail, the rail trail, was recently purchased by the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. The first bit of the expansion we see is expected to be on the Watsonville portion of this corridor. Your question. What would you consider the highest and best use of this option for transportation purposes? This is really interesting. Um, being someone who is physically responsible, I have a hard time seeing how the rail, once it gets through its phase of the people kind of being curiosity phase, being effective and how it's going to pay for itself down the road. And that's going to fall on the tax dollar. That's going to fall on our taxes. So we need to actually think of ways to be effective with our use of money and what will be the best route of getting people to and from North County. I'm, I'm for widening the, widening the freeway. I don't know if you've ever been sitting in that traffic before. It's unbelievable. But if you're on a, a rail trail, on the railroad, and you're taking it to go to work, if you're not, if you don't work close to where you, where the stop is, then you're not going to be using it. You're going to be having to use some other source of, of transportation. It's not like a city where you have subway stops where they take you and they kind of drop you off, you know, close to your work. So this has to be an effective use of our money. I don't see it that way. I think that we need to also work on other forms. I'm a big proponent, proponent of widening the freeway. I know they've just started down below, or started, started up in Santa Cruz. It needs to, needs to continue and finally um, meet itself up here in South County. So, um, and that's where I think that our money should be, should be spent, um, finding an alternative way. Because I know at the end of the day, we're gonna be stuck with the bill um, for the rail trail, and I don't think any tax pay, taxpayer is gonna be wanting to pick up that bill. I know I don't want to. So, um, but transportation is a big issue, and we definitely need to start thinking outside of the box when we are figuring out what we're going to do. Right now, one of the logical things to do is definitely continue working on Highway 1, um, widening it when we can, and yes, even if we have to do it at a snail pace, at least we're continuing to do it until it's done. Um, but that is, I, I believe, our number one um, issue that we need to start working on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Medina. And we're going to Highway 1 step here. We have more than 30,000 cars commuting over Highway 17 daily for better paying jobs, and even more drivers commuting to Watsonville onto Highway 1 for work placement in Santa Cruz. This results in a large share of employed residents in South County utilizing Highway 1 resources to get to work. Your question, how would you prioritize and advocate for relieving this problem? <laughs> uh, the highway in the state of California, it is Caltrans and it is uh, a part of the Regional Transportation Commission that one of the board members sits on. And they um, look 10 years down the road to set aside funds so that Caltrans has enough money as we move forward to do the widening that you're seeing coming our way and to do uh, improvements on off-ramps and on-ramps so that we can move uh, cars. Um, so that means we have to have a very close relationship 
with our assembly member, our senator, and I do. And uh, as I told the Farm Bureau, uh, we don't have to like all of the assembly members and the senators, but they are our assembly members and our senators, and we have to work with them, and I'm happy to work with them on your behalf. So I'm in agreement with most of my colleagues here that it is very important to keep funds to widen the highway and the off-ramps and the on-ramps. We almost gave away, about six months ago, $500 million to the member of the Board of Santa Cruz uh, that represents Santa Cruz to take our money and put it in the Highway 9 exchange. And thank God that didn't happen. Let me just uh, talk a moment then about the rail trail, because there is no rail in the trail. I am working hard with the farmers of this valley and very educated. I was just there yesterday with Peter Navarro. I've been there with Miles Ryder. We got a serious problem um, as the rail trail takes 30 feet of either side of that railroad track and, uh, and has people um, walking and having a great time with their, with their pets uh, on this trail. Go back a couple of years, earthbound farms. They thought a cow got in there and uh, went poop or something, so now we have 40 more regulations and we have to put fences to keep people out of farms, and now we're putting our farmers at risk by bringing people, this trail splits their farms. So here's what I propose. We're gonna do a, an alternative around where these tracks are, and there's actually a place that was pointed out to me yesterday that we got to start working on. And I'm working on that with the Farm Bureau and with the farmers that are supporting me. And I'm going to get some, some help from some of the other Board of Supervisors because we got we got to create an alternative for about the first two or three miles going outside of Watsonville. One quick comment about county roads. Here's how this works. The county engineers figure out what the priorities of fixing roads in the county is dependent, and I know my time is up, on how bad the roads are from the Santa Clara County line to Aromas. The only way we change that, but that I change that, is at the budget hearings with my other members of the Board of Supervisors to move our projects up, or after they're done, is to try to work a trade so you look up here and say, who do you think can make the best trade with the other members of the Board of Supervisors? Because it ain't happening now. Thank you. <laughs> Betty, do you have any cards? Um, if you can come up with me, what I'd like to do is to offer five minutes of time for each of the candidates to go ahead and give me a conclusion any recap of any items that may have been addressed from other other candidates? Five minutes. You have a five minute window. And what I'd like to do is to go ahead and start backwards. Um, Mr. Medina, I can have you begin. I think I'm going to shade it four and a half for you though, if that's okay. Okay. That's fair <laughs> enough, right? I have a, I have a two minute close anyway. So I'm going to go back to my overarching issue here because we're not going to solve any of these problems until we solve ourselves. We gotta stop suing one another, we gotta stop stopping each other from doing things, and we gotta stop looking backwards. So I'm proposing that uh, uh, I, I've reached out and I've got a couple of people in each of these heavy hitter groups that are willing to say, I'm willing to change. And when we start that with no big project in front of us, we can start to build a little bit of trust in one another and start looking forward instead of backward. And we got to do that before we start tackling everything that we talked about. I'm ready to do that. I'm here because I want to work together. Oh, and I got to tell you, the other reason for that is everybody else in this county, trust me, in this region, look at us as a dysfunctional family. They don't pay any attention to us, and we think it's because of them. It's because of us. We don't play well in the sandbox. We gotta get our political act together. We gotta get some, we gotta 
step forward boldly with one voice, not five voices that are yelling at one another. I'm here because I want to work together with you. To do that, I have to win this election. I need your help to do that. I believe if you compare my experience over 43 years and my success, that you're going to feel very comfortable to recommend me to your friends and to vote for me. I'm the only candidate who has worked in the past in this exact type of government. Uh, I have had a $15.2 million budget with 104 people in my staff. I have driven the crime rate down 25% consistently over 20 years, and that's with some years with some heavy spikes. So I know how to create an environment for people to succeed. I know how to lead. I came out of retirement to help facilitate Chief Solano's battle with cancer, and I was perfectly willing to give up this job to do it. And I think it's a miracle that he's back, and the fact that he's back has helped me get in this race. So I'm ready to put my leadership and experience and dedication to work for you on this board. Watsonville and Pajaro Valley is not an island. We are all interconnected, and we have to realize that. We're connected regionally and countywide. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dutra, I'll have you coming up next for your thank you. closure. Again, thank you everybody for coming. I'm, I'm usually a lighthearted, fun, crack joke kind of person. It's not even pretty serious because I look around our community and this is a serious problem we're in. We should be angry about what's going on around us. We should look at our roads. We should look around and see the fact that we're not getting resources and funds down here. We should look to see that we're stagnant, we're stuck. I am in a new generation. I'm the youngest running here. At almost 40, I will also be probably the third oldest on the supervisor board since three of us will be under 40. But it is time that we start moving forward. We cannot continue to stay in the past. If you look at that, if you just look at the fact how we're not able to create jobs, how the fact that our infrastructure is old and not improving, we're not creating a place that people want to come back to. And this is, this is a hard lesson. It's hard to, hard to learn and hard to hear. But it's time that we put somebody in there that takes this seriously. You know, I know our current supervisor, as quoted in the Santa Cruz Weekly of this past December, saying, maybe I should compromise a little bit more, but I don't want to compromise too much, and I don't want to compromise my values. Well, guess what? We need to compromise. When you're in a relationship, you compromise with the person you're with to get something done. If you don't compromise, nothing will get done. That's why in four years, he did not win one vote. This needs to resonate with you, you, you guys. Not one vote was won. He did not get three other, he got two other supervisors to add up to the three needed in order to get something passed. We cannot continue going down the same path. If we want to change, we need to put somebody in there with the fire in their stomach to get the job done. We need to get our roads fixed, our kids on sidewalks walking home. We need to be, we need to be, if we live out there in the senior village, we need to be on a plane going to Washington, D.C. to work and lobby FEMA to make sure that their rates do not go up. That is the first thing we need to do. We can stand here and say, I support, I support, I support, but until you put that into action, nothing is going to get done. I will put it into action, I will move forward, I will make sure that these important issues are taken care of. And I know it's this, I, I sound very strong, and I'm, but this is a serious issue. If we want to continue bringing people home, we've got to make sure that we start fixing things. Things have not been fixed in a long time, so we look around and we feel comfortable where we are. We need not to feel comfortable anymore. We need to know that we are, we are better than this. The moment you hit Aptos, the world changes. You see where the money is spent. We need to bring the money home. We have Martinelli, Driscoll, West Marine, Granite, major corporations where our tax dollars leave this community and they do not come back. They are redistributed to the north and they do not come home. And that will stop on my time. That will stop. I want to thank you all for just listening to me. I, I appreciate it. 
I know I've gone to many of your homes. I'm going to continue doing this. I've done this for days and days and days. I know when ballots come out next week, the time is here. I'm sharing my vision to everybody. I hope I have everybody on board because change is coming, and I am that person to do it. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. Thank you. And for our next candidate, we're going to go ahead and have speak with Mr. Sanson. This seems so strange. I've never had four and a half minutes to talk. <laughs> I hate to play off my other candidates, but I have proof that I know how to compromise. My wife of 30 years is sitting right back here. <laughs> Lynn says, stand up, please, Lynn. <laughs> Takes a little bit of compromise to make things like that happen for 30 years. A lot of people have asked me, why are you running for supervisor? And you know, I, I'm, I love this place. When I got out of college, I came home. And I started a business. And I worked with what used to be called the CBID, the Central Business Improvement District. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, I was on the board of directors. I was the founding president of Pago Valley, um, Pago Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. I'm past chairman of the uh, Bay Federal Credit Union. So experience working with finances and with development and uh, economic well-being is stuff that has, has been part of my history. A lot of people have asked me, uh, well, I've been a realtor for 27 years. Uh, and part of that is that I'm all about family. Uh, when I own a printing company, what I learned was when you own your own company, you go to work early in the morning to get things ready for when your employees come in. And then when the day is done, you stay as long as you have to to make sure the work is get, getting done before you start the next day. And so I spent a lot of time at work, and I could do it then. But then when I had kids, my priority is, was, and will be my family. My personal family, my extended family, and all the friends that I have in this community that have grown up with me. You know, contrary to what you may be hearing, a lot of people have stuck around, have gone to college, and have come back because they love Watsonville. They love the Pajaro Valley. I love the Pajaro Valley, and I decided to come back here and do what I could do to make it a better place. And that's what I've been doing for all these years. One of the important things for me is balancing a budget, because we're all talking about the economics that are happening. And having been in public <coughs> office for so long, and I was first elected to the Pajaro Valley uh, School District Board of Trustees in 1985. Uh, before that, I was a city planning commissioner. And, you know, having gone through the cuts that have happened in the schools, I know one of the most important things for me is not only, like I said, that it looks like the money's gonna start coming, but making sure that we're not just spending the money because it's coming. To be very fiscally conservative and look at what is the best use of the money. What is the best use of working with our county employees, city employees, district employees, those types of things, to be effective. And that's what I've been doing for all these, these years. I've been part of balancing those budgets and making sure the reserves are in place so you don't have the ups and downs that you've seen. You know, the county went through, the city is going through, the furloughs. And there's nothing worse than needing something on a Friday morning that you didn't know you were gonna need and not knowing that the city's not gonna be there until Monday. And then when they're overloaded at that point, as a realtor, I'm working with the county planning department on a regular basis, with the city planning department on a regular basis. And things don't get done when you don't have the staff to do them, and they don't have the tools to get things done. So when we're looking at funds finally coming in, we need to look at what's the most effective use of those funds and making the whole process, especially at the county, more user friendly. Not only in planning, but in all of our services that we provide and to get as much public input and employee input to make those changes happen. Everybody has to buy into the process. And my experience makes me the person to make that happen. So I would hope that you would consider me. I'm asking you for your vote. I am gonna be outspent in this campaign drastically. But I also believe that this, there should be more than this. There should be more running for, for public office than raising a lot of money. And what you've done, and what you want to do, should count for something. And I'm counting on you. Thank you. Thank you.
And for our final closure this evening, I'm going to go ahead and give it to our Cabot, Mr. Cabot. Thank you. Four years ago, I didn't run to go along and get along. Uh, it, it's, I'm not running for, to join a, uh, a, a mutual admiration society. I ran to represent the people of South County and make sure we got our, our portion of the pie of the budget, okay? And everything I'm talking about here really relates to my wife and my children and your, your children and your families. We're talking about a, almost a $300 million budget that we're working with. My whole thing with working on the budget when I first ran was that we run a budget the same way in good times and as in bad times. When we had a lot of money, it was overspent. Uh, they promised it to the future, they promised it to pensions rather than raises. We're going to give you more, we're going to give you more. Um, that, that isn't fair. Uh, my, my wife is here and uh, my, my son is playing Little League Baseball at this time. I'm missing the game, but uh, I'm, I'm going to take a, uh, this is an exception actually, that I'm not watching this game, I'm here. But I take my family very, very uh, seriously. Uh, we, we have 2,150 public employees uh, employed by the county. 215 make over $120,000 a year. You pay it. You're the, you're the people that pay for everything that we have, and myself included. Uh, that's taxpayer money. We have 12 people making over $200,000 a year on taxpayer money, and we have one that has now uh, actually reached the $300,000 mark. Am I going to go out there and just say, hey, I'm going to compromise and yeah, go along with all these races? I said I stand up for the rank and file workers. I'm not standing up for more races at the top. In the first year that I, that I was on the board, they were going to lay off uh, 25 people and they were almost all rank and file workers. I said I'm not going to go along with this. If we're going to lay anybody off, it's got to be at the top. You can't just tell people that they're gone. We had contracts with those rank and file people. We can't have department heads going out there and they don't have anybody to hold the shovel. They don't have anybody to do the clerical work. Those are the people that drive this economy. Uh, if you can't have a department head and nobody working uh, for that person. So it, I, what I'm saying is we, we, have to, we have to look at the budget and it has to be a, a sustainable. We can't promise the future because your children and my children are going to have to pay for it. I have twin daughters and uh, uh, when, I, when they grow up they're going to have to pay the debts. We can't, we can't have unsustainable pensions that are breaking the state of California and they're breaking the county uh, budget. It's going to get worse and it's going to get worse. I made a commitment to uh, making sure that we got tax money for the South County. I think votes that came my way, we, I don't think it's insignificant that we had uh, Wheelock Road and uh, uh, Hazeldell and Green Valley, which is a $308,000 project where the money was approved by the board on a unanimous vote. And, uh, and I pushed it with Public Works. That project get, got done, it was three, three weeks and waiting. Uh, we've also had uh, $94,000 spent on uh, Paulson Road. We had $60,000 spent on Carlton Road to get rid of the washouts. So that's very significant. I stood up for the fair, the airport. That brings in a lot of the, to our economy, approximately $3 million a year. I'm not for building around the airport because that will end up closing the east-west uh, runways and that will end up closing the airport. Atkinson Lane I've opposed since the beginning. The 65 acres out there is not a, a good a, a plan and a, a good project. I think we're all defined by more than the title we hold. Faith, family, and friends are very important to me. I'm going to be the same person on June the 4th as I am on, uh, that I am on June the 2nd. What happens on June the 3rd doesn't change us, okay? And as far as campaign spending goes, I commit that I will not spend more than $20,000 between now and June the uh, 3rd on the election. 
And uh, that's what I'm going to raise and that's what I'm going to spend. We can't have a culture of greed take over uh, politics. Thank you. Thank you. I, I've had the opportunity to take a look at some of these questions, but perhaps um, in, in closure, um, you could have an opportunity to do a little bit of meet and greet and ask the candidates themselves if they're willing to stay a little bit. What I'd like to do in, 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 conclusion, in closure of my housekeeping is to acknowledge again the, uh, the use of the facility. So, uh, Pastor Robin, thank you again very much. I, I do have uh, a little bit of um, help here with uh, pg &E offering us some coffee for this evening. Make sure we can keep you bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for our, our questions and answers. And our committee is made up of a few of us. Um, Betty Bovita was offered, uh, had offered her services to help um, look and review and uh, provide some expertise on the client questioning. So thank you, Betty. Marty Corley, who's done an efficient job of timekeeping as well, has participated and uh, supported us with the, the line of questionings and the dialogue to use for the candidate forum this evening. So what I'd like to do is to go ahead and offer some conclusion this evening and perhaps if the candidates would like to stay, maybe there would be some audience members that would like to approach you on some of these questions and perhaps others in meeting with you this evening. I do appreciate everybody's time for coming. I'm, I'm grateful to have such a good turnout. And I hope that that makes a difference in you for voting um, for the candidacy this year. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.